I like speed. I like my machines to run fast. And the base clock on the RP2040 just isn't cutting it. So this morning, we're talking about oscillators, we're talking about clocks, and we're talking about how you can get the most performance out of your chip. Computers run off these things called program counters, which are essentially just registers that point to a uh, instruction in memory to execute. And it, it, with like arm and thumb mode, it's a bit more nuanced, but um, just for simplicity's sake, the chip will read that instruction that the program counter is pointing to, uh, kind of decode the machine code, say like, okay, I need to load this uh, register here and perform this operation and then store it in this register. And then it will increment the uh, program counter by the instruction, uh, by the width of the instruction. So in the case of arm thumb mode, uh, we just increment that by two bytes. And this is all performed in what's known as a clock cycle. So within the rise and fall of the clock, the chip will execute the code. And there are some multi-cycle instructions, such as like a conditional branch. So you have like one cycle for checking the conditions, and if it passes, you'll have another cycle for actually branching. But um, in most cases, like in most arithmetic operations, there's just a single cycle per instruction. So if we want our code to run faster, we're going to need a faster clock. And if we want a faster clock, we're going to need a faster clock source. Most clocks will be using uh, an oscillator as a source. And an oscillator, as the name implies, is just a component that oscillates between a high value and a low value. So on the Pico, we have two oscillators. We have the on-chip ring oscillator and the uh, off-chip crystal oscillator, which is that silver square right below your uh, chip. So if you haven't already, grab that documentation. And uh, I believe it is chapter section uh, 2.17. So the ring oscillator, I'm not much of an electricity guy, but the ring oscillator is essentially just like, it's just a ring. It's a ring of inverters. Um, and it, I think a good word to describe this is like paradoxical. So the inverter, will, its output is connected to its input. So it's con constantly trying to invert itself, which creates this very unstable signal. And that's, that's the thing about the ring oscillator. It's, uh, it's very easy to implement, it's very energy efficient, it doesn't take much to run, but it is highly unstable, and it runs very fast. So uh, this is um, very, very straightforward. Um, it's so fast, in fact, that it is recommended to divide the signal to slow it down to a reasonable speed. There are, uh, there's like temperature specifications, whatever, that the chip should run at. We're not really going to look at that. Uh, I don't really care. Um, I mean, it's a $4 board. It can fucking catch on fire if I care. But, uh, yeah, so the ring oscillator is what the chip will run on uh, after boot. So it will, on boot, it will just default to the ring oscillator. And we can very easily configure this to uh, a, f a very fast speed. So the first register we're going to look at is the control register. And uh, very simple, we have this enable bit, which will be enabled on boot, so don't fuck with this. And then we have this frequency range. So uh, I don't know what it defaults to, but we have like low, medium, high, and too high. And they explicitly tell us not to set it to too high, but we're going to set it to too high. So let's, uh, let's, grab that, um, let's grab this base address. So uh, let's go down here. Uh, let's go. Let's try to keep things in a uh, order. So we're at sixty thousand. So that means let's go after the GPIO. I just like to keep things organized. So ring oscillator read write, and I believe that was your X four zero zero six followed by four zeros. Uh, if I'm not mistaken, uh, yes. So now, um, let's, uh, let's just start off racing. So enable ring oscillator and let's, uh, let's load that address in. 
and the first thing we're going to want to do is set it to too high so we need this fa6 um let's see how would we do that? let me grab my calculator so f times 16 what was that fa yeah fa plus 10 so we have 250 so let's move 250 into r1 and then we'll shift this over by four and then add a six to this to disappoint the engineers over at raspberry pi and then let's store this into the control register so the next irresponsible thing to do would be to go to the divider register and we get to choose to divide it between uh, 0 and 31 oh, 1 and 31 we can't divide by 0 sadly but uh, yeah we have to give it this password of um, AA0 so let's uh, yeah, before we even set it to too high let's uh, move R1 and what is AA in decimal that is 10 so that is 170 so 170 and then we'll shift it over by 4 and then let's add a 1 to that and store that in the oh, what was that offset um 4 we'll store that an offset of 4 and that is our divide by 1 so we're uh, hands off we're just going to let the clock run at what it wants to is this a good place to stop potentially well, we can actually increase the frequency of the signal so the signal will go through four uh four stages uh and we can increase the drive st drive strength at each stage so we have two frequency registers frequency a and b and i think um i think it gives us like a kind of a guide to how to change the frequency but i'm not fucking reading this so let's just um yeah, well, let's just put at the max drive strength for each stage. So each stage is a value from uh, zero to seven, and let's just let's just set them all at the maximum speed. So let's uh, let's move R one, and what are we looking at? So seven, and then what is this? That's sixty four plus thirty two plus sixteen plus seven. So uh, let's see, 19, we're moving 19 in, and then we're going to shift that over. Uh, where are we going? So we're going to shift that over 8. And then we're going to add 119 back to that. So we have these bits set, these bits set, these bits set, and these bits set. And there is uh yeah there's nothing else we can change so let's just store this in as an offset of uh one and two so one and two now I almost forgot well in fact I did forget I uh, I recorded it and then realized I forgot to add it was that. The engineers at Raspberry Pi don't trust us degenerates, so we have to give the frequency register a password. So there's this password field right here, and we have to give a 9696 in order to change the drive strength. So let's um let's just create a new uh, a new global down here. So Rosk PW and we'll just give that byte four zero zero X nine six nine six to make them happy and then let's uh, we'll have to change these to uh, have to use another register and let's load that password in and then let's add that all together so now we should uh we should have full uh, this should be in full throttle on our ring oscillator and i don't got no fancy tools like an oscilloscope 
So we're just gonna use the um, the same blink loop we made yesterday, and this will just be a good method to see how fast the uh, the chip can run through those delay cycles. First, I'm gonna run just the base vanilla clock on boot. So this uh, let's uh, plug our Pico in. And that is slow as fuck. Um, I, I can literally feel the estrogen. So let's uh, let me uncommon a couple things. And uh, let's get that extra horsepower in there. So now if I reload that code. And then it'll run. Much better. I don't even know if the camera can pick that up. So as cool as that was, the problem with the ring oscillator is that it's unstable. The frequency is just unpredictable, it's inconsistent. So it's recommended to switch to the crystal oscillator after boot. Um, and the uh, before I jump to that, I just want to mention uh, a cool thing you can use the ring oscillator for is this random bit register right here. So if you're, uh, if you're out of sync with the ring oscillator, as in like running on the crystal, you can uh, you can take advantage of the ring oscillator's uh, sporadic behavior by uh, using it as a source of randomness. So you can just read this uh, read this register and just give you a uh, a random one or a zero. So I, I think that's cool. But uh, you want to go to section two point sixteen. So the crystal oscillator is that little silver square in between the chip and the Raspberry Pi logo on the Pico. And it's uh it's literally just a crystal. It's it's a rock. It's um I'm, I'm I don't know anything about chemistry or anything, but it's like you just send like an electrical signal through it, and it gives you like a very consistent, predictable signal. And this is great for uh, especially for like very time sensitive applications. So um, it's a uh, it's very straightforward to use. It uh it literally just has like this control register, this status register, um. And then this startup register right here, and uh, very straightforward. So let's uh, let's grab that base address. Uh, what is it for? Okay. So let's uh, let's put this to keep things in order. Xosk read write, and let's go byte four zero x four zero zero. Was that? I think it was two four. Uh, yes. And then uh, it's also um, we're gonna want to have the atomic set. So set, and then that is an offset of two thousand. Uh, so yeah, uh, I feel confident about that. And let's um, let's get rid of this enable Rosk code. Sadly, and we'll enable. Exosk. So just load that uh load that base address in. And then if we look at the uh the frequency range, we're just gonna set it uh, it just has the standard 115 megahertz frequency. We don't have as much control over the frequency as we do with the ring oscillator, just the base crystal oscillator. Uh there's a there's a surprise later on. But um Let's uh let's just load that range in. So what is that? AA, so that's move R1 170. And then we'll shift that over uh four bits. So after we do that, we need to uh we needed to give it its startup conditions, so it's uh, it's kind of weird. It has to have like this delay to catch up with the system clock. I I think that's what it does. Um, so you have the startup delay. Yeah, specify how many clock cycles must be seen before the crystal can be used. And they already did the math for you. So you literally just need to put forty seven in this uh in that field. So where we start up. And then we're gonna want to put a 47 in this delay, so we just um, 
we'll just move R1 uh, 47 and then we'll store that in that startup register and now we'll want to actually start our crystal so we have to uh, this it's a good idea to do this atomically so we'll load that uh the atomic address so exosk set and then we'll uh so it has a weird um a weird startup value uh, where is it yeah we have to give it this uh this fab this uh this weird startup value in this specific field so it's um let's go down here and let's just say exosk enable and then so what is that so zero zero fab and then I think I'm I think that's is that good yeah that's good and then we just uh you know load that in and store that and this should start up the uh, start up the crystal so because uh, because we have a startup delay and we actually have to wait for the crystal to turn on we're gonna have to kinda have a wait loop like we did with the uh, resets so we'll load the um, the read write back in and let's create this little loop so exosk stat and in the status register right here, they decided to put the uh, the st uh, signal that it's stable and running all the way at the end. So what we're going to do is load that value into R1, and it is an offset of 1. So we'll load that in, and then we're going to shift that over 31 times, and that should pretty much mean that if that bit's on it'll be the only bit left um other than that if it'll just be zero so we'll just say branch of zero to exosk stat and this, this should run until the crystal is running and stable so once we got the crystal running we'll have to switch our system clock over to the crystal by configuring our clock sources so if we go to section 2.15 we're just going backwards. Um, let's see. So there are a bunch of clocks built into the chip, uh, and this is this is very useful to know. So we have this reference clock, which is just um, as the name implies, it's just used as a reference for other systems. Um, we have the system clock. This is this is what we care about. This is what the program counter runs on. We have the peripheral clock, and this this will be useful when we use uh, peripherals. Um, the USB gets its own clock. The analog digital converter gets its own clock, and then the real time clock, of course, gets its own clock. And they all have nominal frequencies. Oh, and um, if you got like an oscilloscope or some, you can have one of the GPIO pins run as their own like clock pulse. So. Um, I, I don't know how you'd use that, but it's there. So when you're playing with the clocks, it's pretty easy to fuck things up. So there is this resuscitation circuit called the rhesus. Um, it will just it will detect if the if like the system is locked up, it'll switch the system clock over to like an auxiliary source. Uh, I I haven't really messed with this, but uh, th this uh th this is here in case if you need it. So let's grab that base clock address and that is 8000 so let's put it after the ring oscillator. So clock read write I think I got that right. Oh, it's um it's actually much further behind which makes sense it's uh it's the clock's kind of important so 
let's uh let's load that in so clock and we'll load the uh clock read write and we only care about two registers here so we have all these um these controls and status and dividers but what we care about is um the reference clock which is this is how we connect the clocks to the crystal and then we're going to base the system clock off the reference clock so first we go to the reference clock control and we can choose our um, our clock source here on reset it will just go to the ref uh, the ring oscillator but we want the crystal so we're just going to uh, switch that over to 2 and then store R1 R2 and that is an offset of 12 I'm getting better at uh, hex math and then uh, for our um, system clock let's uh let's go to that control register so we can um we can choose our auxiliary source which is what the recess will jump when to uh when it fucks up but we just care about the the regular source and we can choose between its auxiliary or just the straight reference clock so we're just going to go reference clock and then store that in And it's offset of, let's see if that was 12, so this is 15. So I have the uh, the same count value in that delay function from the, uh, for what we use for our riced out ring oscillator. So let's, uh, this will be a good comparison. Let's upload that and see our, uh, see the crystal. And it's a, it's pretty slow. Um, you you can't tell, but this is a uh, this is a very stable signal, and it's a it's considerably slower. But uh, we we can change that. So to catch our crystal up to speed, we're gonna use this thing called the PLL. So go to section uh, two point eighteen, and uh, I have no idea what PLL stands for, but it contains a thing called the voltage controlled oscillator which is uh it's just this thing that increases the frequency of the source so we have two pll's we have the uh pll system which is the one we're going to be using and then usb gets its own pll because usb is like its own little system in and of itself so grab that uh base address we're using um pll system base so let's uh where is that so O2. Let's uh let's put it after the oscillator, the crystal oscillator. The O28. So uh, let's go PLL sys read write. And that was byte for zero x forty and before we forget because this is a uh, a non-essential subsystem if you will we're going to have to bring it out of reset so just like we did with the GPIO uh, head over to subsystem resets and PLL sys is 12th bit so just um, yeah, we can just copy the code we wrote for the uh, GPIO so GPIO reset clear and then copy that. Um, let's go after this. So, uh, let's see. PLL reset PLL. And because we're using the fifth bit, we're going to have to, uh, not the fifth bit, the twelfth bit. We'll have to shift this over by 12, and then let's uh, say enable PLL and load that base address in. And the uh, the documentation gives us um, a pretty good step-by-step uh, -step instructions 
on actually enabling the PLL. So we can skip the first step and then we program a feedback divider, turn on the main power and VCO. The VCO is going to lock itself. So when it warms up, the uh, frequency is going to be unstable. So we need to lock it until the frequency stabilizes. So we can set up our post dividers and then finally uh, turn the whole thing on. So uh, we'll also we'll need a uh, atomic clear register. So so PLL sys clear, and we're adding eight, which is going to be eight plus three. So we're adding three, so that's going to be B because of hexadecimal. And then we can say, um, so we were here. So now we have to set up our fractional divider. So uh, let's see, FB div, our fractional feedback divider. Yeah, note this PLL does not support fractional division. Um, so it gives us like parameters, uh, like a way to calculate the parameters, but um, I don't really care. So we're just going to load 255 in this. So because I've experimented with this and that is close to the maximum value. So to avoid math, we're just gonna make it simple and store 255 and that is an offset of three, no two. So two FB div. And now we have to um, load that atomic clear and we are clearing in the power register uh, the fifth and first uh, zeroth bit um, so move that would be 33 so store that not type. So now we need to wait for the PLL to lock itself. So load that uh, load that read write address back in and then create a loop. So PLL lock and um, we'll load. So in the status register the lock bit is the 31st. So we'll load that in And then shift that over by uh, 31, and uh, kind of like what we did with the um, the crystal oscillator, we'll wait for it to uh, for that bit to set. So once the PLO is out of lock, the next step would be to uh, would be to set the primary output divider. But um, we're not gonna fuck with this, so. We'll just leave this at B, and then we can um, you know, we can turn the thing on. So let's uh, load that atomic clear back in, and we are powering up the uh, the post divider. So this is the last uh, the last step. So we'll move a um, what was that the third bit? So we'll move a eight into that. Now all we have to do is switch over our system clock from the reference clock over to our PLL. So uh, let's see, clocks, and then if we go back down to system control. So um, there's two primary sources, the reference clock and the auxiliary auxiliary source. So uh, it, um, on default, the auxiliary source is the PLL, so we don't have to change anything. We just set this over to 1. So let's uh, say clock PLL, and then we'll load that uh, load that clock address back in, and then move a one and store it. And that was an offset of um, it's fifteen. Now let's uh. Let's plug this in and see that uh, the new improved clock. I'd say that's sufficiently fast.
You know, it's um, it's not that uh, cheap horsepower the ring oscillator had, but if you just want a nice uh, a nice fast stable clock, uh, Crystal plus PLL is uh, is not a bad combination.